My name is Onye Ozuzu. I would like to first join everyone in saying Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And on behalf of your children, hey mom, I got your graduation. <laughs> um, congratulations to all the graduates of 2018. I am here to introduce one of your fellow degree recipients, Daoud Bey. Or, as the chair of the photography department insisted that I refer to him as The Bay. So, just a few months ago in 2017, Daoud Bay was named a MacArthur Fellow. <clears throat> now, I've decided to start my remarks there, just cut to the chase, boom. I, in the original version of this intro, that was how it ended. So this is kind of like telling a joke by leading with the punchline. Why would I do that? Well, here's why. As I prepared to make this introduction and gained a more clear and nuanced understanding of exactly what the MacArthur Fellowship means, I began thinking about what it means that Dawood Bey got this award at this particular moment in time, and I experienced an interruption in my own perception of him and the import of his work. It left me preparing for this presentation until the very last minute. So forgive me, I'm here reading off my iPhone and I'm gonna be in the moment, I'm gonna be a little improvised, a little rough and raw. All right, you with me? With me? Yes, okay. So the MacArthur Fellowship is referred to by the press as the MacArthur Genius Award. It was described by Celia Conrad, the director of the MacArthur Fellowship in the following ways. It's an award that no one can apply for no one even knows that they're being considered until they receive a phone call that informs them that they are going to receive no strings attached, significant support for their work, period. It's an award that looks for individuals who are engaged in the process of making or finding something new or in connecting the seemingly unconnected in significant ways. They are looking for people in, on the precipice of a great discovery or achievement. The award is speculative. It does not recognize, it does not recognize lifetime achievement, but it invests in an individual's potential. It's an award that recognizes creativity in the society as a whole, that it recognizes that we need creativity in stories of individuals who have taken risks and persisted through failures. So it endeavors to support people to take risks and not be afraid to fail to renew our human spirit. MacArthur means to recognize individuals who demonstrate a track record of enduring accomplishment through tenacity, imagination, and risk-taking. They collectively reflect the diversity of American creativity. So when you open up your program and read his bio, you will see that our own Daoud Bey, MFA from Yale, professor of photography at Columbia College Chicago since 1998, is coming up on 42 years of productivity and contribution to the cultural landscape as an artist, a scholar, and one of the most significant photographic voices of our time. You will see that his work has been noted and honored in a long list of solo exhibitions all over the nation internationally, and I will leave you to read the rest of those details. What was significant for me to bring to this moment is to consider the fact that he is eminently worthy of a Lifetime Achievement Award, but the award that he has gotten in this moment is an award that means that he has been nominated for and selected by the national cultural leaders of our current moment for who and what he is right now and what he's poised to do next. And that is powerful, that is impressive. And it is a testimony to the integrity and the active ongoing art practice that Daoud has and is continuing to put out in the world. When I met with him soon after the MacArthur Award was announced as the dean of the school in which he teaches, I asked him what he wanted to do and how could we at Columbia help to celebrate him. And this is what he said. He said, I don't need another show. I don't want it to be about me and my photography. I want to produce programming. I want to bring other artists, creatives, thinkers, intellectuals from many disciplines onto campus, into Chicago. I want to engage them and the communities that they gather in conversations with our students and faculty. That's what he said 
that I could do for him, help him do more for us. I was struck at the generosity of this response. And I was also struck on how truly it resonates with the core ideas that his work projects. I think perhaps that this intense curiosity and general interest in us, his subjects, ordinary, ordinary people like you and me, emerges most poignantly in the happenstance of the interruption that this award made in the introduction that I would have made, one that talked about his accomplishments and his shows, his, re his publications, and it refocuses me in this moment on why is this artist's work important and what is he likely to do next and how is that gonna matter? Daoud Bey's work, his art making, exemplifies that never say die, never laid back way of the quintessential contributor to human existence that a functioning artist is. And his particularly, particular contribution in the work of por portraiture, photographs of people nuanced by a particularly evocative layering of place and context and technique. In his own words, he says that he is concerned with trying to make resonant photographs of ordinary people. He curates a momentarily sustained engagement and attempt to invest their lives visually with an enhanced degree of psychological presence as well as formal and material description. He made his work walking the streets of Harlem for 10 years with a handheld 35 millimeter engaging people that he met and learning to facilitate them presenting themselves to the lens. He brought two people together from a given community who did not know each other, sat them very close together and captured them figuring out how to present themselves while simultaneously negotiating this fresh and short-lived moment of relationship to one another. He stopped young people on the street in Chicago and made of them a contribution to a portrait of what life was like in the United States in that moment in time. He looked back on his work in Harlem 40 years later when Harlem was gripped in the manipulative and, and transformative process of gentrification and gave us an opportunity to look again, to see ourselves again in our changing contexts. Or in the Birmingham pro Project where he made the searingly intelligent choice to photograph children who would now have been the age of those four black girls burned in that church bombing and adults who would have been the age of the women had they lived. He gives us, as black people in the US, the opportunity to individually and collectively be seen in the contexts that embroider our humanity to the identity of this nation. And he gives the nation an opportunity to collectively own it, to see unflinchingly and unapologetically its people, places, spaces, and contexts in our relationships to one another. We are in a time, as Dr. Kim reminded us earlier, that the fabric of our social contract is coming into question. We are in a time where we in the United States, no matter where we sit on any of the landscapes, would have to agree that one of the most critical issues is how we are dealing with the resounding impact of how black people were brought to become American. And what that means to what we as a nation will be in the next 10, 20, and 50 years. I believe that this is why Dao Bay got his award and why what he will do in the next 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years is as important, as exciting, and as relevant as all of the resounding impact that he has already had. It is our honor that he is and has been a part of the Columbia College Chicago legacy and that we are all here today with him to celebrate him in this moment and in this way. President Kim, I present Dawood Bey to receive the degree of Doctor of Arts. by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees 
I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Arts, honoris causa, with all of the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Thank you, Anye Ozusu, for those deeply moving words. Thank you very much. And Dr. Kim and all of the members of the uh, Columbia community, uh, thank you so much for this honor. It is deeply appreciated in ways that I cannot even give voice to right now. I've been teaching now at Columbia for 20 years, and this certainly marks a more than significant moment in my life with this community and institution. I'm certainly happy to have been asked to speak on this occasion, which is an important one for so many of you gathered here today. I offer first my congratulations to the graduating class and to the families who have supported you on this journey. I'm aware that this is clearly a moment of celebration and also perhaps a moment of some anxiety. As those of you who are graduating transition from your roles as students to your new roles as practicing professionals in your chosen field of endeavor. I'd like to offer you briefly my thoughts on how you might go about shaping for yourself what comes next, based on my own 40 plus years of experience as an artist. At the beginning of many of my classes, I have started by going around the room and asking each student both why they are in the class and what they hope to achieve for themselves in the field. Sometimes I go a bit further and ask, what do you want to be doing five years from now or 10 years from now? Inevitably, a certain number of you have answered, I'm not sure, or I don't know. <laughs> After my initially skeptical response, I've then responded that I think you do know what you want to do, but are simply afraid to say it, because saying it creates the challenge of having to make it happen. And it also provokes the fear that it might not happen. So the comfortable thing to do is to pretend that you don't know. But I would suggest to you that unless you are willing to say it, it can't happen for two reasons. For one thing, voicing something, speaking it out loud, is the first step towards making it real. And secondly, how is anyone supposed to help you realize your ambitions if you're unwilling to say what they are? I can't help you if I don't know what you want to do. Once you have said it, 
put it out there in the world. Now I and others know what you want to do, which then allows us to know how to help you get there. So never be afraid to voice your ambitions, to dream out loud, to be fearless, and to see yourselves doing the thing you dream of doing. That is always the beginning. Another thought, wherever there might be for each of you, one thing I know is absolutely true, and that is that no one gets there on their own. No matter, no matter how brilliant you are or how good your work may be. So remember this, everything that happens happens inside of a community or what might be called a community of support. I think of uh, community as being, in some ways, different from a network. It's the difference between doing lunch or having lunch. Myself, I don't do lunch, <laughs> since I neither like to hustle people over food or put myself in the position of being hustled. Part of what I hope you have been doing at Columbia during your time here was forming community with your fellow students. Indeed, you should be thinking of each other as part of a common community, not as each other's competitors. Each of you are the earliest community of support that you will each have. And often, it is that support that is the only thing that keeps you going before anyone else becomes interested in whatever it is you are doing. So it is a responsibility to mutually support and sustain each other. I would further encourage each of you to keep in mind that you are very much a part of the larger social world. If you look at your passport or your ID, I'm pretty sure it says that you are a citizen of the United States and perhaps some other country as well. It doesn't say you are a citizen of something called the art world or a citizen of the creative community or the creative class, but are a citizen of some very real place that exists outside of the bubble that many of us come to work inside of. Being an artist of one kind or another does not exempt you from the responsibilities of citizenship. And in the best cases, you find ways to bring the two things together, to make the creative work that you do have a meaningful place in the larger social world. Now, this does not mean that you somehow have to dumb down your work so that people who are not artists or other so-called creatives can get it. People are smarter than you think. What it does suggest is that you find a way to bring that larger community into a conversation with your work and to realize that being a part of that broader conversation will actually sustain your work. Some of you who are old enough may recall that moment in 1989 before many of you in this graduating class, I'm sure, were born, that began yet another wave of what is referred to as the culture wars. It was triggered by the works of several artists 
most notably Andre Serrano, Robert Maplethorpe, and Karen Finley, whose work provoked an extreme backlash from conservative forces in Washington, most notably Senator Jesse Helms. Helms fanned the flames of his own moral outrage so incessantly that eventually hundreds of thousands of phone calls began to come in from people all over the country to their representatives, protesting artwork that most of them had never seen from artists they had never heard of, and calling for the elimination of the National Endowment for the Arts, which had awarded fellowships to two of the artists, and further calling for the defunding of one of the exhibiting institutions, which ultimately did close and never reopened. At the urging of Helms and others, the individual pro artist project, the individual artist program of the NEA, founded in 1965 to support American artists in the pursuit of their work, was also eliminated. It too has never been revived. Helms and the conservative right had both created and exploited a divide between the larger social community that suggested that artists were somehow different from everyone else, not a part of the larger social community that we all are indeed a part of, but a separate community of perverse, privileged, and elite individuals who are supported by institutions that are just as separated from the rest of the community as they are. The art community continues to pay the price for this division of our various communities. And it is up to us to continually seek to build and maintain those very relationships. All of our lives depend on it, as there are always those who seek to divide our various communities rather than encourage ways to bring them together in a mutual conversation. Finally, don't be afraid to believe that you can do exceptional work and that that work can indeed sustain you. You've been given the tools to do exactly that during the time you've spent at Columbia. The passion and the rigor will have to come from you, and you'll have to sustain that over many years. I've often said that it is impossible to do really good work and get that work in front of as many people who matter as possible, and nothing happens. You have to believe that. All of those entities that form the infrastructure of our respective field have a constant, ongoing need for new work and new ideas and are always looking for it. Their existence depends on it. As long as you continue to raise the bar of your own practice in a rigorously self-critical way and keep that work in front of people who need to see it, you have every reason to be hopeful and to believe that you and your work will find a place in that conversation. Choosing the life that you have chosen, that we have chosen, is an act of faith. And faith, coupled to mindful action and rigor, has been known to achieve extraordinary things. So, as you go forward, I encourage you, in the words of the late Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, to keep the faith, baby. Thank you.